Well, hi. I hope you're having a great week. I'm Kevin Robinson, the pastor of Macon Road Baptist Church, and welcome to our preaching and teaching ministry. We're coming to you, as you can see for yourself, outside in God's gorgeous creation, and we want to talk to you, this program, about another one of God's glorious creations, and that is the resurrection from the dead. This is the time of year where Christians around the world, churches, are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we want to do that today on this broadcast. I pray you'll get your scriptures ready. Tune in with us as we look from the Word of God and see the implications, just how much the resurrection of Jesus plays a role, plays a part in the everyday Christian life. The Apostle Paul points out that everything is riding on this event. I don't know if you've looked at the resurrection that way, but you should. The apostles did, Jesus emphasized it that way, and we ought to also, that everything is riding on the reality of the resurrection. Before we give this scripture and walk through it together, I want to just kind of give you an apologetic. Uh, that word means defense. It comes from apologia uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3. It doesn't mean to say you're sorry. It's the opposite in the Greek language. It means to defend what you believe. And, a defense or an apologetic for the resurrection. You know, a lot of people will deny it based on what they think is science, and uh, Christians ought not to fear science. Uh, people will say it's impossible for someone to be dead that long and rise. But I want to give you two defenses for the resurrection that I don't know if you've ever thought about. One of the greatest evidences for the resurrection of Christ is that his closest followers didn't even expect it. You see Peter and you see John racing to the tomb in bewilderment and amazement when they hear the report that Jesus isn't there to be found. You see Thomas in John's gospel at the end saying, I just won't believe. It's impossible for dead men to rise unless I can take my finger and put it in the hole in his hand. This wasn't some ploy. This wasn't some scheme that Jesus invented with his followers to uh, pull this off because his followers didn't even believe it. Uh, another apologetic, besides his closest followers not even expecting it, is that nobody on the face of this earth had more motivation and more ability to end Christianity than the Jews and the Romans. The Jews hated Jesus and the Romans, as overlords of Israel, didn't really care for any religious movements outside of their own. They could have ended Christianity on a dime. You say, well, how could they have done that? All they had to do was produce a body. Produce the body of Jesus and Christianity dies. But yet, because of the reality of the resurrection, they couldn't do it. And they had every incentive for doing it, and yet they could not make it happen. Just a little tidbit, next time you're speaking to maybe an unbeliever about the resurrection, Give them that. That's something that they could ponder, they could research, and it really bears a lot of weight to the reality of this event. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, what I'd like to do with the limited amount of time we have is walk through as much of this as we possibly can because this entire chapter just focuses squarely on the reality and, and, and how, how important for the Christian life the resurrection is. Paul starts off by telling Christians at the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1, that I want to remind you, brothers or brethren, of the gospel that I preached to you. Now notice something interesting. He says, which you received, that's past tense, and which you stand, that's present tense, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast, that's future tense, the word that I preached to you. He says, if you don't hold fast your whole life to what I have taught you, you believed in vain. Just as a side note, brethren, when we see people leave the church, when we see people who have made professions of faith for many years deny that profession, we need to stop asking what's going on. The Bible is always clear about that. 1 John 2, the Apostle John says it this way, they went out from us because they're not of us. And you say, well, John, how do you know they're not of us? And he says, if they're of us they would remain with us. 
Christians don't leave the church. They may move geographic locations, but they'll find a local body there because that's who they are. So here goes Paul talking about this gospel. He says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, notice this, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, then to the twelve. Now before we go any further, notice a matter of fact that's pretty important. Paul starts off by saying, I want to remind you of the gospel. I want to teach you the gospel. And what does he get to? He gets to the resurrection. Now Paul could emphasize any part of this gospel he wants. He could emphasize the death, he could emphasize the burial, but he chooses to emphasize the most unbelievable part of it, and that is the resurrection. That is a reminder to us, brethren, no matter where you find yourself watching, a gospel presentation without the resurrection is not a complete gospel presentation. If you say to yourself, well, this is the part they'll have the hardest time believing, therefore I'm not going to share it, then you have robbed them of the gospel. Remember the verse I quoted to you, Romans 10, 9. Paul says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You've got to believe in the resurrection to be saved. That's faith. That's trust. He goes on to say this. After appearing to Cephas and to the twelve, he appeared to more than 500 brothers, Christians, at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. There were people still alive at Paul's time who were witness to this, and Paul was saying, you can go ask them. He then says, he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. I love how Paul describes himself with so much humility. He goes on in verse 9 to say, I am the least of the apostles and I am unworthy to be an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. You can read more of that starting in Acts 8 and 9. But by the grace of God I am what I am and His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. And in case you think Paul's bragging, he makes this clear that he's not. Though it wasn't me. Well, who was it? It was the grace of God with me. So then whether it was I or they, so we preached and so you believed. Here's what they preached. And here's how much is riding on the resurrection as you begin to celebrate this special event. I, I want to push you to consider doing something that every Christian in the first century incorporated into their lives. And in the ensuing centuries, they didn't know anything about a Christianity that didn't do what I'm pushing you to do today. I want you to begin celebrating the resurrection of Jesus every day. You know, in Christianity, the early first few centuries, there wasn't really a certain day. It, it was every day. They did what they did. They could live the way they could because their Lord was alive. Notice how much Paul puts on this event. Now, if Christ is proclaimed, verse 12, as raised from the dead, how can some of you, how can you dare say there is no resurrection of the dead? There were some... This was just too great an event. And Paul said, if we preach it happened, how could, you, how could you doubt us? So he begins to lay the foundation of, here's the implications of doubting the resurrection for a moment. If, if you're not sure of how great the resurrection is for the Christian life, Paul's going to make it clear to you. Verse 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, Paul's saying, you need to understand this. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Here goes the domino effect. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise, if it is true the dead are not raised. You have to take your entire New Testament and throw it in the trash, Paul is saying. It is a lie. Jesus preached the resurrection. Peter, John, Paul, everybody that God used, inspired by the Holy Spirit to write, preached the resurrection. 
Paul's saying we're all liars, we're all frauds, and your faith is worthless if the resurrection didn't happen. Because that's what we believe and that's what we taught you. The implications of not giving yourself to this event, of believing everything God has spoken, if you believe everything from Genesis to Revelation, but doubt the resurrection, Paul's saying whatever you, faith you have in the Lord, it is worthless. The word vain means empty. It, it doesn't have any value in it. it. It doesn't have any meaning. It doesn't have any weight in the sight of God. Verse 16, he continues to detail the implications, and he says, For if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, listen to this, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. There is so much writing on the resurrection that Paul says the cross the grave and the resurrection are intricately woven together. You take away one, you don't have any of them. So for those of you that may be watching that say, well, what does it matter if I believe in the dead being raised as long as I believe he died for me? Without the resurrection, the death is meaningless, Paul saying, because Christ promised he would raise. It doesn't take a work of God for someone to die. We're all going to die. Hebrews 9 is clear. It is appointed to every man wants to die. But it is a work of God to raise the dead. So look at that verse one more time, verse 16. And this is really, really the motivation for why you ought to consider, why you ought to be convicted to not limit celebrating the resurrection to a, a season in the year, but every day of your life. And we sing the old hymn at, at, at church, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. You know, th there's really a lot of truth in that. It's because Jesus resurrected that we have the hope we have. If he didn't resurrect, how would we know his words were true? So he says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, verse 17, then you are still in your sins. No, he's not done. He says, then also, those who have fallen asleep in Christ, they've perished. They're gone. Verse 19 says this, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people, we Christians of all people are most to be pitied. If all we have is, well, we're Christians and even if we're wrong, it, it's a better life to live as Christians today, you might as well follow Jesus. Paul's saying you're wrong. Without the resurrection, everybody ought to feel sorry for us. We're the ones persecuted. We're the ones suffering. Without the resurrection, everybody ought to pity the poor Christian because we have no hope. We have no hope. He goes on in verse 20 to say, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man, referring to Adam, came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ was first. He is Lord. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule, every authority and power, for he must reign, now he quotes the Psalms here, until he has put all his enemies under his feet and the last enemy to be destroyed his death. I want to skip down to verse 29 because it's an interesting passage that has caused people difficulty for a long time and it's important for us to understand it as we celebrate the resurrection. Paul's built up how important it is and why no one should doubt it and then he says this in verse 29. Otherwise, what do people mean or why are people being baptized on behalf of the dead? You know, interestingly, archaeology has, has demonstrated this, and historically we have many writings. There was a town right off of Corinth. Corinth was an isthmus that jutted out there. And there was a pagan religion that baptized people right out in the ocean in the hopes of entering the afterlife. Baptism was not a new practice with Christianity. In fact, even the Bible records John the Baptist doing it before Jesus came. Baptism was a symbol. 
and it's the water of purification. It was the symbol of people needing to be purified. And people had believed in the resurrection for a long time. And there were people in Paul's days who were baptized in belief of a resurrection. We know he's not referring to the church or Christians because of the wording there. He says, what do they or what are people? He never refers to Christians that way. To Christians, he says, us or we or the church. They're pagans that are baptized for belief in a resurrection. He says, if the dead are not raised, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Jesus Christ our Lord, I die every day. Skip to verse 35. He says, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body do they come with? Paul's response is, you foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. We think of agriculture and farming, how the seed is buried. It's buried in the dirt, and that seed has to die for new life to sprout up out of it. So here's what he says. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind of humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of heavenly is one kind, and the glory of earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for stars differ from star and glory. Now notice Paul here, verse 42. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, this fleshly fallen body. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Brethren, Paul is emphasizing here to the church the reality of the resurrection. It should be a fact in every Christian's mind. And he's going further than that and pointing out, this is going to happen to you, it's going to happen to me, we shouldn't question it. In fact, when we look back in verse 35 and 36, he says, you foolish person. Nature testifies to resurrection as we sow the seeds and they bear new life. So I want to challenge you today. As we prepare to celebrate this season of resurrection, do you celebrate the resurrection every day of your life? The only reason we have new life, the only reason we have the promise of eternity is because Jesus died and rose again. You know, I started out with an apologetic saying to you that the resurrection is easily defended by the fact that Jesus' closest followers didn't expect it. What do you think about the resurrection? Do you celebrate it at all? Do you understand the Bible presents us as dead in the death of Christ and alive in His resurrection? Paul goes on to say in verse 50, I tell you, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, when that trumpet sounds, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Notice this. This perishable body, this fleshly, fallen, temporary body must put on the imperishable and the mortal must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Now here's how we're going to close today. Oftentimes, when Paul gets into the deep wonder and amazing things of God's grace and his love for his people, he burst out in doxology, just worship himself, which we see to some degree he does here. Many of you, maybe you experience that when you hear the preacher preach something or you sing a hymn and it's just so overwhelming, you can't help it. He says, the sting of death is sin, the power of sin is the law, 
but thanks be to God. He gets all the credit for this, all the glory for this, who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord, or through our Lord Jesus Christ. All of this, the Christian life, is rooted in, it's founded in the fact, Jesus raised from the dead. If Jesus worked the miracles that he worked, the most incredible miracles that have ever been performed. If he died on that cross, suffered, bled, and died, and did not, did not resurrect, Paul wants you to know Christianity is a sham. This is not an option to believe this. In other words, there are implications for your life, and doesn't he close with that? Look at the last verse. Therefore, in other words, Therefore is there because there are consequences to follow. There is something to happen because of what he has said prior. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast. Stand on the word of God because Christ is risen. He has given you every proof you've ever needed. Be immovable. Meaning don't blow in the wind with every kind of doctrine that's coming and going. Peter said this also, 1 Peter 5. He says, I've written, instructing you, this is the grace of God, stand firm in it. Because Jesus has gone to such great lengths through the resurrection, Christians have a role to play in this. And our role is to be dogmatic with this fact. He also says, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. I want to do something that we like to always do but um, don't always have the opportunity. You know, as the church, we exist to share the truth, the glory of Jesus Christ through his wonderful gospel message. It's, it's why we have what we have. And as we celebrate the resurrection season, we understand that sometimes people are more sensitive to the things of Christ or more inquisitive to why so many people celebrate this event. I want to close today by presenting the gospel to you. It has to be in short form because of our limited time. The gospel is that you and I, on our own, can never do enough good works to please God because good works don't pay for our sin. The Bible says in Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. As I stand here, a minister of the gospel, a pastor, there is no righteousness in me apart from Jesus. That's important because most people don't believe that. The Bible tells us why we're not righteous. It says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all broken commandments. And because the wages of that sin in Romans 6 is death, Jesus Christ came to pay with his death what we could not pay for on our own and continue to live. So what is the response? After dying and rising again, if you will trust Christ, I'm not talking in this really weak, this really feeble presentation. I'm talking about the power of the gospel as Paul talks about in Romans 1.16. If you will trust God, that's what the word faith means in the Bible. Trust that He is your righteousness. Trust that what you can't do on your own, Jesus did for you on that cross and he did it when he rose from the grave. You can have life in his name. If you're watching and you say, man, that sounds great. How do I get that life? You know, the good news of the gospel is you can't earn it. The good news is it won't cost you a dime. The good news is right where you sit, without me, without anybody else, you can surrender your life by faith to Jesus and become part of God's kingdom. You say, Brother Kevin, what words do I need to say? You know, a lot of people like to give magical formulas or prayers, repeat after me. I don't want to do that with you. And let me tell you why. The prayer you need to pray has nothing to do with me. It is you as a sinner getting on your knees before God and saying, Lord, have mercy on me. Forgive me. And trusting that everything you need pertaining to righteousness, everything you need pertaining to eternal life, everything you need to be cleansed of your filth, of your judgment, of your wickedness, is in Christ. 
the sinless Lamb of God. You don't need to belong to a particular denomination. You don't need to belong to a certain form of, of group of people or, or cult. You need to come to know Christ. You need to know Christ. After that, then you find a Bible-believing church. Then you find a group, a body of like-minded believers who stake everything on His Word. I want to close our program today by just thanking the Lord for giving us this opportunity and maybe praying for you if you have surrendered your life to Jesus. Afterward, I'll uh, encourage you to stay tuned, give you some information on the bottom of our, of our screen on what next steps you ought to take as a Christian. Let's close our program by praying together and just thanking the Lord for this season of resurrection. Father, we are so grateful. Our words do not describe, they do not come anywhere near articulating how grateful we are for your son, for what he did on our behalf on that cross. And furthermore, you raised him from the dead, giving us every hope, every assurance that we need that life is in Jesus. And death has no power anymore to those who are in him. Father, I pray a deep prayer of sincerity for those who are watching who you are using this broadcast ministry to perhaps reach and save for your holy name that as unworthy as I am to present your gospel you would use our words to convict to build up and to save the gospel words to make men and women children even who are watching this program make them your people and save them through Christ we ask this because we love you and we ask it because we want Jesus glorified. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, isn't that amazing? Just how much the Apostle Paul hung as a foundation for the Christian life on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can't read 1 Corinthians chapter 15 without a sincere belief and understanding that Paul thought there is no Christianity without the resurrection. And because of the significance of this event, it has implications for everyday living. You know, I pray that as you watch this, you are encouraged. You understand the importance now that every day you live your Christian life, the resurrection ought to be celebrated. And the resurrection has significance more than just for one period in the year, but every day we breathe the air that God has given us. We're so thankful for you. We, we encourage you to reach out to us. Our contact information is on the bottom of your screen. And we wish you a very happy resurrection season. Until next time, we pray that God blesses you and your family. We hope this program has been a blessing and would like for you to join us Sunday mornings at our East Campus Church on Highway 64, three miles east of the Wolf Chase Mall. Visit our website or call us for more information. Be sure to tune in next week as we bring you another challenging message from the Word of God.